Good morning, church family. Oh, almost. Good morning to, yes, good morning to everyone. Church family, we are welcome. We're, we're excited to have you here. Welcome you to um, the service and to our second opportunity that we get to hear from Carl Wilkins this morning. So a uh, little bit later than our normal, only because of our time in Sabbath school here in the sanctuary. So we are glad you are here with us. I don't know how many of you are excited that we have turned the corner into fall. But I have enjoyed the rain, I have enjoyed the blue skies without the humidity. So for just a moment, for a bit of an icebreaker, for those around you or close by and whatever, is to share with each other your favorite fall beverage. Uh, I was gonna say a hot beverage, but some aren't hot drink people, so it could be cold drink, but your favorite hot fall beverage. So as we begin our worship um, this morning, or continue our worship, really, I was talking with our summer young adult intern, Nick, who has gone back to the Northwest into Walla Walla for his last year in school. Um, But before he left, he was sharing with me one of his favorite passages from Scripture. And what he does with that passage, it's a little unique. Um, And I thought it would be a great call to worship for us today, because when we gather in this space for worship, it's not about preference or, or, you know, what I get out of this. Worship is about our response to God. It's our response to say he's given us so much grace and so much blessing, and we come together to honor him in this time, in this moment. And so the call to worship today is from 1 Corinthians 13, but I'm going to replace the word love for Jesus, which is what Nick had said that he does whenever he reads this passage. And I thought this made it uh, meaningful to me in a way that I hadn't seen it before. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. Jesus is not arrogant or rude. He does not insist on his own way. He is not irritable or resentful. He does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Jesus bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Jesus never ends. Amen? I just thought that was a beautiful way to read through that passage um, anew. So, Let us have just a moment of prayer as we continue in worship this morning. Father God in heaven, we thank you for calling us together in this place, and I pray that you would give us eyes to see you and ears to hear you, and that every aspect of our worship and time together today, with every person involved and participating in the worship, we would all come to see Jesus even more clearly. In your holy and precious name we pray, amen. Welcome to worship at the Kettering Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is your K-Life update. We're so glad to have with us this Sabbath Carl Wilkins, who worked for ADRA during the Rwanda genocide. He's going to share with us two different sermons at First Serve and Second Serve. You don't want to miss this special Sabbath. The DeCapo Ministry is a ministry for children, by children, and for our church. We have our DeCapo Children's Choir that is um, sharing a song with us today. But we also have De Capo Bells and De Capo Strings. If your children would like to get involved with this ministry, please see me. It's a wonderful and exciting opportunity for them to be involved. At First Serve today, Samantha Schneider gave her heart to Jesus in her baptism. And so when you find her, give her a big hug and welcome her to the family. One of our very own young adults, Nathan Verrill, is putting on an Island Home video concert this Saturday night at 7 p.m in the Youth Center. It's going to be a wonderful evening of great music. Come and join us. This coming Sunday, September 30, from 11 to 4 p.m., we have the Fall Fest at Spring Valley Academy. You don't want to miss a day of fun. Make sure you go. Our No Fright Night is coming up October 27, and our theme this year is Treasure Hunt. You want to get involved, and you want your kids to come, so start telling your friends and neighbors to plan on coming that evening, but also we need all the help we can get. So please sign up either at the welcome desk or online. My name is Pastor Alex, and this has been your K-Life Update. Happy Sabbath. Please stand with me as we sing hymn 211, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. 
once for favored sinner slain. like to invite all the kids to come to the front now uh, for the kids life section and we want you to take your time and uh, collect the dollars as you come forward all the kids come forward now
okay kids you can go back to your seats with your parents thank you for coming up and that was wonderful to hear that singing wasn't it good morning church family it's a privilege to be up here to talk about uh, an opportunity that we have to engage directly with our church today uh, I've been asked to uh, tell you that the, the offering today, the loose offering, goes to Washington Adventist University. And how many graduates from Washington Adventist University are in here? There are. And so we support that program. It's a union uh, uh, college educational institution. And today, the funds that we're Going to, going to provide support the Gale and Bruce Boyer Health Professions and Wellness Center, but they also support student missions. And I watch at Kettering College. How many are here from Kettering College? Let's see a few more hands. Okay. Those of you that went to Kettering College know that we also participate in student missionary programs. And it's hard to say no to programs that take young people in a college and give them the kind of experience that you're going to hear about during the sermon. A once-in-a-lifetime, life-changing chance to have a depth added to your life that you can't get anywhere else. Even in the, the pictures we're going to see, you cannot experience what we're going to see today without being there completely. And so today, I encourage you to be generous. I also encourage you to be generous with our local church. I, uh, church family budget makes arrangements for everything you see here, but it also is our lead outreach ministry to our children, our young people, our Sabbath school rooms, uh, that, by the way, our Sabbath school rooms are jam-packed full. I don't know if you've seen that recently, but our young people's Sabbath school rooms are so full. Um, uh, it's like a popcorn popper that we put too much popcorn in. It just blows the lid off. But I invite you to be very generous today as the deacons wait upon you. Good to be with you today. The offering plate gives us a chance to praise and worship God with our resources. And so I'm going to sing praise him over and over. Giving me some trials and some tests 
praise the Lord this morning as I rose to start my day and I praise him on the highway he led me all the way praise him at my table and I praised him on my bed I praised him over and over Today's scripture is found in Romans 9:14. I'll be reading from the New International Version. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. I would like to invite all of you that are able to kneel with me as we come before the throne of grace. Our precious Lord Jesus Christ, we are a people called by your name, and we are astounded by that great privilege. Thank you so much. Praise your name for your willingness to involve yourself in the intimate needs of our everyday lives. Thank you so much for your patience. You call us saints in the scripture, but we need to ask you for your forgiveness for our unsaint-like behavior during this week. To thank you for your patience with us because you do not leave us nor forsake us. We are so grateful that there is nothing in all heaven or earth that can separate us from your love. Father, we are a family, but oftentimes we do not know how to behave as a family, and we make many mistakes. And we ask that you will draw close to us and that your loving patience and your loving kindness will teach us to be more like Jesus moment by moment. We are a family also, Lord Jesus, that has many requests. And so we ask that you will bless Annis, Alice, Charlie, Darlene, Diana, Martin, Paula, the Krauss family, Willa Hedrick. We also ask that you will bless the Dunn family who has lost their loved one. And please, Lord Jesus, we ask that you will bless new members of our family, Emmett Lewis Schaefer and Jackson Norman Price. What a marvelous thing to have new babies born to this group. I ask especially today that you will be with your servant, Carl Wilkins, that you will give him words that will be able to touch our hearts and will be the voice of Jesus speaking to our hearts, growing us, encouraging us, and helping us to be more the family that you have intended us to be. All these favors we pray in the pre uh, blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen.
I'm happy to have uh, my friend Carla Wright uh, bring music uh, this, uh, this afternoon and this Sabbath. Uh, even though Carla Wright traveled here from the Indianapolis area, she's coming home. Uh, for she's from uh, the Dayton area uh, and uh, from the uh, Dale Wright Seventh-day Adventist Church in Germantown, Ohio. Um, the songs uh, that, uh, the song, first song that she sang uh, is a song written by her mother, Eleanor Wright. One has written many, uh, many songs. So it's always very special, uh, I can imagine, uh, to have the opportunity to sing your mother's music. So we, again, thank you so much for worshiping with us this, this morning. I want a heart that forgives, a heart full of love, one with compassion, just like yours above, one that overcomes evil with goodness and love, like it never happened, never holding a grudge. I want a heart that forgives, that lives and lets live one that keeps loving over and over again one that men can't defend because your word is within one that loves without price like you lord jesus christ i want a heart that loves everybody even my enemies want to love like it be like you just like you did I want a heart that forgives oh. want a heart that forgives when the ones that are closest that I've known the longest hurt me the most. I still want to love them just like you love me, even though I'm hurting. Want a heart that forgives when the pain is so deep, so hard to speak about it to anyone just like your son i give up my right to hold it against them with hatred inside i want a heart that loves everybody even my enemies want to love like you be like you just like you did i want to walk like you talk like you just like you did i want to be like you live like you just like you did because a heart that forgives is a heart that will live totally free from the pain of the past and the heart that lets go is the heart that will know so much freedom i want a heart that forgives a heart full of love one with compassion just like yours above one that overcomes evil with goodness and love like it never happened never holding a grudge give me a heart that forgives
been studying through the book of Romans for several months now, um, and we've been just enjoying the journey as we've studied through Paul's quintessential gospel message, a message that he had, that had been percolating and ruminating in his heart ever since his conversion on the Damascus Road. And so now our new series is heading into the last few chapters of the book of Romans. And as we do that, um, we are going to look at focusing on practical applications that brings concepts from Romans to our present day experience here in Dayton, as if Paul wrote the letter specifically to us. And this uh, morning we'll be focusing on how it is that we love and care for each other. Um, As Hannah read, is God unjust? No, not at all. And we'll look at that through a different lens this morning. And I'm excited to have our guest speaker here with us this morning. I was reminded by Pastor Chantel sitting by me in the service that my worlds kind of are colliding on this Sabbath day, that I was actually dedicated as a baby at Germantown. Uh, church by Walter Wright, and then I was baptized here in this baptistry, and then of course I spent a lot of years out in the Northwest, and growing and going to school and all of those kinds of things, and I get a friend from the Northwest here this morning. Uh, We've had the privilege of being able to host uh, Pastor Carl Wilkins here. Spring Valley Academy brought him in for the weekend, and we just get to reap the benefits, but I first met Carl when he was the pastor and chaplain for Milo Adventist Academy in Southern Oregon. Uh, but I didn't know all of his story. And if you have not heard his story, um, he and his family had moved to Rwanda in 1990. And of course, history tells us 1994 was when the genocide took place there. And Carl was the only American that stayed by and helped in uh, working with ADRA um, and providing food and necessary materials and and medical supplies to those that were in need, especially to an orphanage. So we're excited to have him here this morning. Um, I've had the privilege of hosting him as uh, a speaker when I was in Walla Walla, uh, working with different members of his family, getting to know his kids, all sorts of things. We're excited to have him here. Please welcome with me this morning, Pastor Carl Wilkins. Thank you. Good morning. It's um, really nice to be with you. I uh, spend most of my time in schools, and um, a- after the Rwandan genocide, I was actually in, in, at Milo Academy. I always told people I sort of slipped in the back door without going through seminary. Uh, Alf Birch and the team there in Oregon was very open and uh, I suppose progressive and in, in allowing me into Milo Academy, uh, their main request was to just teach the kids about Jesus. And I'm like, well, we learned a few things in Rwanda during that horrible time, but life is a continual journey of, of learning. And um, thoroughly enjoyed uh, each Sabbath morning. I miss that a lot. Coming, I am. Um, I forget how many years ago it was, I just decided to take my shoes off when I was standing there Sabbath morning because it just reminded me of the sacredness and the, the holy ground. Um, and I'd love to, to add my prayers into the prayers already this morning. Father, I am really grateful to be here this Sabbath morning, to stand in your house house of prayer for everyone, to um, sing kind of vicariously with Sister Wright, a heart that forgives. Oh, man. We feel so many different needs, and as we come here, we know that you have abundantly provided no surprises with you. In fact, you even drew us here, and so we thank you for that. We thank you for the privilege of being together, of looking into your word, looking into life stories, and we're we're looking for a clearer picture of your love, your unconditional, unmatched love. So please lead us in that search, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I was welcomed into... Yeah, this morning we had a couple of things. This is a strange idea, this idea of barefooted vulnerability. Um, I didn't really think about that preaching without my shoes. Um, but this last time back in Rwanda, 
there's one of the memorials that we visit there that's a really tough memorial. They told the people in the surrounding um, villages, we can't protect you during the genocide. The government said, we can't protect you at your home. You've got to come to this school. And it was a terrible plot to get them all together and then to take their lives, more than 50,000 people at that school. And the government has made a pretty, um, pretty bold and at times controversial decision when they dug up the remains of thousands and thousands of people, partially for closure for their family. And, and as one young man said, I couldn't walk past this pit latrine every day knowing that's where my grandmother had been thrown. And so they dug up and they, um, with scrub brushes and basins of water, they would clean what they dug up, the bones basically in many cases. And then they would give them a respectful burial. In, in Rwanda, like many developing nations, uh, there's not a big uh, caretaker, undertaker, mortician business. The families do it. They wash their loved ones. They dress them in their best clothes. They dig the grave usually with friends. And, and then they place them in the ground and they shovel the dirt in. I've stood in the uh, lines often. You tap the guy on the shoulder who has the shovel. After several pitches, he hands you the shovel. You then a few and somebody pitches your shoulder and, and touches your shoulder. And, and, and the whole thing, you know, from birth to death, the family is so involved in the genocide. One of the many horrible things it did was interrupt that process, as you might imagine. And so folks, I've, I've seen them sit around, scrubbing bones, talking, sometimes laughing. I mean, as they're remembering, we've all been to funerals and those funerals are full of laughter and then tears and laughter and tears. And then somebody laughs really loud and they're like, oh wait, that was maybe too loud for a funeral. But they're like, no, this is, and we're celebrating a life. And Rwandans found different ways to process. But some of these bodies that were not claimed were, um, in a rather crude way, preserved with lime and um, laid on tables. So they're kind of mummified. In some cases, uh, often in a fetal position, which would have been the position that they were in as they were killed. Um, it's it's uh, the skin stretched tight over the... I, I won't try to get too graphic here, but it's a very, it's a very difficult site to visit. And we told the young people we were with, there's no, we talked a lot, in fact, about whether we would even go there, and they wanted to go. They had studied about Rwanda. They, they, they felt that they, for different reasons, some for honor, others just simply as a witness, as they would go forward and share the story of Rwanda, they felt it was important to go there. We said, you don't need to go into each classroom unless you choose to. You might choose to stand at a door and look in. The smell is very strong. The smell of decaying human flesh is different from animals, like you might, you know, on the side of the road or something. It was my second time there in just two weeks because I had been there with a group of teachers. I chose not to go in the classroom this time, uh, to stay outside and be there for the students who wanted to talk and, and process this. And um, I sat down on a bench. It was a warm day, and I looked at the grass growing around me. I actually took my shoes off. I took my socks off, and I started walking in that grass thinking, blood, much blood flowed here at this place. And somehow, life keeps going, and grass grows, and trees grow, and, and um, I listened, and there were kids chattering and laughing you know, on the next hill. I heard music from a wedding playing on another hill. And as I thought about this sacred ground where so many innocent lives had needlessly been taken, I thought to myself, you know, some of the time my mindset has not been right here. It, we've been focused on those who took the lives so much and the violence is just, it's just so obvious there. But this ground is sacred, made sacred by the blood of those innocent lives who were taken. And as I walked barefoot through the grass, I stepped onto the cool cement of the sidewalk. 
and I started to walk in the rooms. And I really couldn't begin to imagine the unfulfilled dreams that the young, the middle-aged, and the old maybe, some of the fulfilled dreams that they had had. Couldn't help but think about Jesus coming again. And these old dry bones, as they say, new life. We have this hope, and sometimes it is, it is clouded, it is shadowed by the horrors. This morning I would like to share with you just in the next few minutes a few stories um, from that time in 1994. And uh, I, oh yeah, I was, gonna, I was in some other schools here. We'll skip over this this way. I, I do get the privilege of going to public schools, private schools all around. Um, shucks, on Thursday, started out at Dresden, went to Tree of Life sc High School in Dresden, Tree of Life Christian School in Columbus. Stivers, is that right? School of the Arts? Yeah, those, those kids were just so insightful, uh, the arts. And, and as we talked there about caring for your heart, I had such a wonderful time there. And, uh, and then that evening here at the academy with some parents, the next morning with your kids at Spring Valley. You know, one of your kids at Spring Valley, when I asked them, uh, a, a survivor, um, well, I think we're almost there. We'll, we'll get to his picture here in a minute. Um, Rwanda used to be known for gorillas and now, tragically, it's known for genocide. But I think that reputation is changing. I think the day really is here for those who have visited, especially for the young, young people that we were there with. Um, the, did, did I? Yeah, we were there with teachers and, um, and then these young people. And both the teachers and the young people, they said it might sound cliche, but this is life-changing for us. And... Um, one of the kids, uh, as they were at the end of their visit, this is a very special school for ethics and global leadership, a semester school, one semester of their junior year of high school. They go to Washington, D.C. to this school. Um, one of the students wrote, um, I found out in Rwanda forgiveness is not as much for those who did wrong as it is for me to set me free. In fact, I almost think it could be selfish, she said. <laughs> but they were beginning to explore these ideas of forgiveness and, and, and listening to the testimony. Um, one of the survivors, okay, I keep getting ahead of myself this morning, especially when I was talking about going back to that school. My mind just goes back there. Real, real briefly, my wife and I, um, right out of college, we get married, and six weeks later we're in Zimbabwe. Our daughters are born there. I'm teaching at a secondary school. Teresa's working in the business office. After six years, we come back. I go back and get an MBA, and, and uh, our boy Sean is born there in Maryland. Um, and we take a call to Rwanda as the director for ADRA. Always have to throw in as a proud dad a picture of the family today. Got a wedding coming up. I could not be happier. I love this guy. I, uh, I've heard people say, you know, you're not losing a daughter, you're getting a son. And I am like so excited about this son. <laughs> I can't, I could, I went on a ride. He's a police officer. Okay, I'm too easily distracted, but. Um, <laughs> In, in there, ADRA, we're building schools, very rewarding work, you know, operating clinics around the country, and our kids are just loving it, a great place to raise children. Um, the tragedy starts, well, doesn't start, but the fire, the explosion, you could say, starts on April 6, 1994, when the president's plane is shot down. They blame the minority. There's a long, there's been a three-year war. There's a long story, which I won't get into the history, but this doesn't, that's why I'd say it didn't start April 6. But, but um, there had been killings going on for years in, at smaller degrees around the country before that. But this is going to be the one that, that just is going to astound the world where nearly a million people will lose their lives. But for us in our house, uh, we're putting the kids to bed in the hallway, gunfire, you're trying to keep them away from the windows, you know, and, and we're trying to make it like a, 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 um, a kind of like an adventure 
while this horror is, out, is, is playing outside our house, our neighbors here, the little ex there, they're some of the first ones who are killed. And, and um, we don't even know when we're putting our kids to bed that a gang gathers at our gate and some of our neighbor ladies come and stand in front of our gate and tell stories about taking a neighbor. We took a neighbor to the hospital. You know, she, the baby wasn't coming, usually born at home. We took her. Little acts of kindness. Our neighbors are arguing with people who would do us harm. Thursday night, they turn them away. We don't even know until the next morning what our courageous neighbors have done for us. And um, yeah, they said their kids play with our kids. The embassy says we're all leaving, the ambassador, everybody, nobody is sticking around. And nobody, they said, has a choice. Well, I'm on the radio talking to her because Teresa and I, talking to Laura, the consulate officer, Teresa and I had been in the bedroom, we talked, we prayed, we made the decision. I always kind of wrestle when I tell some of these stories because I don't want to race through them. But there's parts two I want to get to about, about Rwanda today and what's happening there and this journey of healing. But we can't really get there and appreciate it without being here. And yet there's much here to unpack. So please be patient with me um, as, I, as I tell the rather abbreviated story. Laura tells me on the radio, we're all meeting at the ambassador's house over. And I go, okay. Um, I've directed the people at the dental clinic to meet there over. Good, Roger, good copy. I'm sending my wife and children there over. Wait, what do you mean you're sending them? We are all leaving over. I said, no, I'm, I'm not leaving over. Teresa and I had been in the bedroom. We had talked and prayed. We had a young lady who lived and worked in our home, and she was marked to be killed as part of the minority group that was being blamed for the killing of the president much longer campaign of constructing an enemy. Enemies are constructed, hey? They're not born. And, and so, so I'm telling Laura, I'm not leaving over. She says, you don't have a choice over. And I'm like, as a private American citizen, I do have a choice over. And then she says, okay. And she's a wonderful friend of ours, wonderful person. Um, she, was, she was just trying to do what she was assigned to do. She was really torn. She wanted to keep the embassy open and make that a safe haven. She was arguing with Washington, D.C. Finally, she says to me, okay, then you need to write on a piece of paper that you refuse the help of the American government to leave Rwanda over. And so I remember writing on a little, one of our kids' notebooks, a little lined paper, I refuse the help of the American government to leave Rwanda and tore it out and folded and gave it to Teresa and... Um, she and the children left, went to the neighboring country, Burundi. She didn't want to come back here to the States. She was afraid of losing contact. And um, eventually she took the children to, to Kenya because Burundi was too unstable. Every single day we... Okay, I need... Will you come for a minute here, Teresa? I'm sure you guys can help us with this one. I am being mindful of... The, thank you, sir. Being mindful of the clock, but I can't have Teresa here and not have you hear her voice um, and I just love standing here with her she was 16 when I met her in academy and um, we've been on an amazing adventure over the last 37 years and um, every day we had Teresa made uh, heroic efforts to find somebody to watch our children walked down the streets of Nairobi, a very dangerous city at that time, and, and uh, go to the American embassy. They bent the rules, let her in the communications room, and I had hooked up my little radio to a car battery, and I'd static, and I was listening for this sweet voice call over the radio. And uh, her initials are TW, Teresa Wilkins, but in radio talk, she would use, she got proficient in radio talk, <laughs> and she would say, Seven six seven six. This is Tango Whiskey. Do you copy? <laughs> Do you see this big silly grin on my face? <laughs> Our home radio station was seven six, and and um, I would I would then say yes, Tango Whiskey. This is seven six. Go ahead. And sometimes we would talk for hours, as if she had nothing else to do. I'm in the middle of the genocide. She's over. In, in a foreign country, a single mom, as it were, 
doing laundry in the bathtub, homeschool, all kinds of stuff. But how do you do that, huh? Some of us were so busy, and when we talk to people, they know we're busy. And some give the impression that you are the most important thing right now and got all the time in the world when you know she didn't. There's a lot I learned about Teresa during the gen- during the genocide. <laughs> There's a lot more I'd like to do, but thank you, love. (laughs) And so Teresa is there. I'm in in Rwanda. Our work, you can, I I made tapes to Teresa and the kids. For the first two weeks, I'm arguing with God. I'm saying, look, God, you wanted me to stay. Keep me alive, huh? That should be the deal. And it's really stupid because it's as if I know more than God. I, I don't even love me a fraction of what God loves me. And I kind of love me, but nothing like God. And God knows what's ahead. And God has, God has all of these plans and all these pathways and all these care packages along the pathway, and I don't know anything about them. And finally, I quit arguing about staying alive. And I say, okay, you know what it is, God. I'm afraid. I grew up Adventist, and yes, you're saved by faith, but there was this crazy phrase. I, some of you might remember this, but it stuck and lodged in my head, and it haunted me. And, and brain pathways, you know what they say? They say negative stuff, the neuro people, negative stuff sticks like Velcro. Positive stuff slides off like Teflon. This phrase was something like safe to be sa- safe to save. Did any of you ever hear that phrase? I don't know what. There must have been great intentions, but for me, I just saw myself as not safe to save. I knew my weak, I knew my mistakes, I knew my repeated, you know, repeat offender type of stuff. And it wasn't really until I was completely desperate that I said, okay, God, you know me, I know me. It's not about me, it's about you. You said you have a place for me. And you said, if I will believe you, you love me, you have boatloads of forgiveness, you throw my sins, you don't ever bring them back and rub them in my face. You got a place, I'll save you. So I said, save me. If I die, I want to leave something for Teresa and the kids. And so I started recording cassette tapes, stories. So by the time the genocide is over, I've got about eight hours of stories that I record, recorded for Teresa. So I'm not going to get into some of those stories. I, I thought I'd get into them in this morning service, and then I don't know, I talked about other stuff, and now I thought I'd get into them, and now I'm talking about other stuff too. But um, I, I will just uh, share with you, the young lady did survive. I, this, I was at her home just a few weeks ago with her sons and her husband. The young man survived. Um, and uh, the pastor who joined me, I can't get done telling you how much I appreciate Pastor Sarai and his wife. He was this wonderful source of wisdom. They could have gone to another part of the country. They had the ID card that let them through, the, of the majority, that let them through the roadblocks, but they chose to stay with me. An enormous help. She was so practical and helped us get food and, and survive. And Pastor Sarai said, if you're going to do anything outside the house, you got to build a relationship with the people in power. We went through the horrible roadblocks and we met this man and I began to build a relationship with Colonel Renzaho. I never saw the other side that that he was orchestrating and killing and, and the horrible. I saw another side of this man. He will be hunted down and captured and tried and he's now in prison for that side that I didn't see. The side I saw we became allies of sorts and there's a lot of stories of working together with this man trying to stop people from being killed and he'll give me a travel permit he'll send me to an orphanage I'll be bringing food and water to these little kids I mean it's a densely populated part of the city Um, but where I am going to um, take you to this morning uh, that's the director today of the orphanage in fact um, this young man came up to me when I was there this summer and of course, I didn't recognize him. He was a little kid at the time of the genocide. And he gives me this big bear hug. He's there working at an after-school program now. It's so neat to talk to these people. Um, the, the story that we didn't make it to this morning and that we're not making it to this afternoon is um, working together with my Rwandan friend, Gasikwa. And um, 
my other uh, ADRA, both of them ADRA colleagues, Dawson, um, we were bringing food and water and medicine to these orphans. We're surrounded one day. They had threatened to come and kill everybody. Now they're here to do it. For some reason, they don't while I'm there, and the massacre is stopped. And, and, and I, I apologize for just going past that. If you want, you can. You know, I take the books with me usually to schools where I go to speak and make them available for kids who want to read it there just for any size donation. So a lot of them go out of schools. As a result, there's a bunch of them used on Amazon. So if you want to, <laughs> you want to grab one of them there, you can, you can grab it. But we also are printing another batch of 10,000. So you can read these stories. You can get your hands on a copy, I'm sure, easily. Or it's on Kindle, so that's easy this afternoon. Um, but what, where, I want to, where I want to go with you here this morning, or this afternoon now, this morning we talked about meeting the leader of a killing squad and the reframing and reclaiming, putting forth the, the five most important principles to me about God and claiming them for his life. Those five uh, principles, um, okay, actually I will. I wasn't going to this afternoon, but I think I stuck them down. Yeah, here we go. These five principles, uh, I, was, I was talking to a, a, a teacher at a Catholic school, and I was telling him about meeting this man 21 years after the genocide, being super angry, and then these five uh, truths that help center me, help, help get me back on my feet, starting to substitute his name for my name in these five things. And I said, now, to the teacher, I said, now, there's got to be something here. If this is really true, like, like real rock-solid truth, it's got to transcend religions. Because I think real rock-solid truth, God is not bound or contained in, in this religion or that nobody has, nobody has a, a, um, a monopoly on God. <laughs> and God's truths, are, I believe, are communicated in many ways, most powerfully for me through the life of Jesus. But I said, if there's some truth here, and, and I was, we were actually at dinner, and it was the teacher's wife, she was a social worker, she said, "Read the, uh, tell me those five again, because I, I was just telling them at dinner. And she says, that sounds like unconditional love to me. And you look at those things, and I'm like, yeah, I'm always with you. Take great delight. You're my child. My love will come. Yeah, I've got everything you need. It's not about you. It's about me. I am your shepherd. I'm your redeemer. And I started thinking, unconditional love. Whew. How can that not reframe the world? That's important. How can that reframe the people I'm still struggling with? Or in this afternoon's case, the institutions I'm still struggling with. A year ago, April, I was um, invited. Okay, let me get myself back here on track. Here we go. I was invited to the United Nations for the commemoration of the genocide. And, and they, um, the Rwandan government actually invited me. The United Nations didn't. The Rwandan government did. And they were having this at the United Nations. Um, I was super... I was honored by the Rwandan government, but I was really torn to go to the United Nations because the United Nations had 2,500 soldiers in Rwanda at the time of the genocide. That was enough by the, um, by the thinking of the Canadian commander, General Dallaire, he felt he had enough soldiers to stop the genocide, but he needed support. They were poorly equipped, most of them, and he needed, but the, most of what they, what they needed wasn't guns and machine guns. They had what they needed. It's called presence. Soldiers, about 300 did stay. They took 2,200 away and abandon the people. And, and people had come to schools where the UN soldiers were and, and thinking, whew, we're safe now. And then the soldiers left. Mothers were trying to put their babies in the truck of the soldiers leaving. They were begging, don't leave. And 3,000 people at one school were killed because the soldiers abandoned them there. And the killers like, thank the soldiers. You made our work much easier. The people came here. Now we don't have to go hunting for them in their homes, in the ceilings of their houses. And, and the, the hor it's a horrible story of abandonment, of betrayal. 
They were going around with their, with their fancy UN vehicles and their armored personnel carriers and, the, and some of the soldiers well equipped, the Belgian paratroopers, full military gear, trying to give people the message it's going to be okay. And people believed it. While on the other side, this storm, this, this man-made, politically driven storm was growing. And the UN is saying it's going to be okay and the storm is coming closer. And most time when people see storms, they run. But in this case, they saw the UN and they stayed. And for many, that meant their death. Now, I'm glad the UN came initially. I think that was a great move, solidarity. But they didn't have a flexibility and ability to change when the times changed. And they said, this isn't our mandate. And they abandoned the people. So when I'm invited to come back to that building, I'm like, These, this is like the heart of abandonment. The death of hundreds of thousands of people. And it's beautiful. They can have candles and flowers and everything. But I went at the invitation of the Rwandan government, but I didn't know what to say. Oh, well, and they only gave me six minutes, so <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't tough. But what am I going to say in six minutes at the UN? And I prayed. That's what I do. I journaled. And I said, God, what? And the Rwandan government had asked me to speak on the um, lessons of Rwanda's healing. And so I said, okay, what they have taught me again and again is you don't have to define people by their one worst action. People can be defined by what they do next. Now let's simplify it, okay? I say something thoughtless to my wife. Is that going to define me? Or is what I do next going to define me? If I follow that up with another thoughtless statement, it'll soon define me. But if I, and, and I say, well, you know, I'm tired and I'm not feeling well. Yeah. That was thoughtless. I am sorry. You don't deserve that. Will you forgive me? We can be defined by what we do next. So here I am at the UN, and I'm realizing I'm defining the UN by their worst actions in Rwanda. And so I apologized, actually. I didn't know how. How do you apologize to the UN? Now let me not skip over. I didn't know when I was telling you this story this morning, I didn't know how to how to depict the betrayal of the UN. And I wrestled with the idea of putting a picture in here or not. Because at that memorial site, at that school where the bodies are preserved with lime, there's some pictures of some of the kids before. And so I'm thinking of these children, and I'm thinking about their innocent loss of life And I um, hear this guy, this gentleman, sorry, is the Secretary General uh, two years ago. Actually, I'm not up to date. He probably still is. I turned to him and I said, I am sorry for defining the UN by their failure in Rwanda. They had already, the UN has talked about its failure in Rwanda, so I'm not like, this is not some backhanded way to rub your nose in it. This is just me trying to get free from my anger and resentment. Because that's the core for me, the core definition of forgiveness. I don't know what I expected, if he would graciously nod or something. <laughs> he just, I, he just, sat there, which I don't know what I would do if I was sitting there. I don't know what he, he was probably wondering what was coming next. But then I turned to the stories of the people of Rwanda for the last couple of minutes, and I talked about Trifine, a lady who worked at the biggest orphanage I was at. She not only was treating the children who had seen many of their parents killed the horrors of that, but she also was treating those who did the killing, they would bring their wounded buddies to the orphanage. And I'm like, how does Trifine do that? 
How does she treat the children who are sobbing at night, waking up screaming from nightmares? Comfort them. Wipe their runny noses and deal with their runny bottoms and then dress the wounds of the men who made these kids orphans. And my best guess is that Tryphene doesn't see them that way. Tryphene has reframed and reclaimed those people before many of the rest of us would even imagine that. She saw those young men, I think, in much the same way she saw the children at the orphanage as her children. This ability to reframe is so crucial to us, to me. And if you get a chance, there's a podcast, Invisibilia, one of my favorites, and it's called The Personality Myth, and it gives many wonderful tools for this reframing of the other, believing that people can really change. We believe that, we say that, and I believe it with my heart, and I love it when we say God can change someone's heart. And I'm like, yeah, but how? Because a lot of people hear that and they're like, well, doesn't seem to be changing my heart. And God gives us very practical tools. That's the brain stuff I skipped over earlier there. The new pathways that we can develop in our brain. The choices that we make. The, 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 the choice to look for the good. The choice to not define people by their worst actions. The choice to, to express gratitude. The choice to be open and vulnerable to find... I don't pray yet. We have a song to close. I'm just going to share this one little piece here from, um, yeah, there was a whole part of forgiveness too to, uh, for me and the U.S. government, which we'll save for another day. Okay, I got to tell you, I was really angry at Clinton, all right? And then about a year ago, I'm walking by a lake, and there he is. And I had wondered if this day would ever happen. He was our president at the time of the genocide, and he too was leading the UN to say, no, don't stay in Rwanda. It's people who had the capability to do things and didn't do those things that was making me so angry. And so I'm like, do you do it or not? Here he is. This is your chance. So I walked up to him. Okay, wait a minute. I should tell you, this was a dream. All right? But I mean, I mean... Honestly, it was, it was very real. You know how real dreams are. And in this dream, I walked up to him, and I wasn't angry, and I wasn't resentful. And I said, excuse me, Mr. Clinton, and he turned. And, um, okay, this is really silly, but one of my core values is to be vulnerable, okay? So I'll tell you. I said, um, my name's Carl Wilkins. Do you recognize that name? <laughs> I mean, okay, I was the only American that stayed in Kigali, but I'm like, I don't know if he knows that or not, and I don't know why that was, it was a dream, okay? And he goes, no. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, I just wanted to say hi. And I walked away, or I woke up, something. <laughs> but I wasn't angry. Getting free of anger and resentment it's so, and, and reframing is a huge part of, of that. If it's okay with you, um, can we not do the last song? And I'm going to ask Teresa to play. Wait, though, did somebody prepare? Was it, was it a congregational song? Or was it a special music? Is it okay? I got permission from the brethren. <laughs> Teresa, would you come and play? Um... I'm always looking for an excuse to get Teresa to the piano. Her mu music just moves my heart like, like very few other things do. And we have an agreement. We've been married for 37 years, and so we make different agreements. And uh, I agreed to read something while she plays a piece here before we have prayer. Okay? So I'm finding it here, but if you, you can go ahead and start if you don't mind. I am... Um, I wrote this piece uh, quite a while ago, and this is kind of off the cuff. That's why I'm just finding it here. But it's about freedom. Those of you who, have, uh, who are familiar with Galatians 5, you might find some parallels here. Um, 
freedom. It's clear we've been created for freedom. It's our birthright. Freedom to love and be loved, freedom to serve, our birthright. Just stop and think about your happiest memories. Didn't they have something to do with exploring or learning? Weren't they somehow connected to serving? Serving without any thought of repayment, serving without any thought of duty or obligation, just the sheer joy of doing something you could do for someone else, the sheer joy. Or maybe that memory's wrapped in a moment of being loved, loved unconditionally, especially when we know we don't deserve it. Freedom doesn't mean doing what we want, getting what we want, searching for what we want. That's how we lose freedom. That's how we end up labeling and trampling each other and losing sight of the image of God in each other and tragically, eventually trying to exterminate each other. You see, I believe freedom is discovered when we encounter the other or freedom is threatened when we encounter the other. The choice is ours. And, and who is the other? Someone far away or someone fascinating, someone repulsive, someone feared, someone longed for? Who are we the other to? Do I see the other as enriching my world or do I see the other as spoiling my world? Is my world safer with the other or would I sleep better knowing the other is far, far away? What would happen if I entered the other's world? If I sat silently with the other, if I staggered under the huge emptiness of the other's loss, if I was paralyzed by the other's fear, if I sobbed with the other, if I simply walked with the other, and asked myself why the other attacks, hides, gives, takes, screams, is so secretive. Do I have the desire, the courage? Will I take the time to enter the other's world? You see, I believe every encounter is an opportunity, and every opportunity demands a decision. So freedom, it's clear we've been created for freedom, this free choice God gives us, freedom to learn, to love, to serve. And personally, I believe it is discovered when we encounter the other, but, but the choice is always there. It's our choice. Will you please stand with me? I pray. Father, we thank you for this time together in your house. The good news is it doesn't have to end. Your spirit can continue to go with us, take the stories, the thoughts, the impressions that, that, were, that you customized, because the stuff I'm sure changed from the time it left my, house, my mouth till it got to some people's ears. And that's what we want. We want your spirit to do that so we can hear just what we need. So please do take this and... Uh, might it continue to kind of marinate and then grow and, and impact my heart, my life. And I think there's others here who share that prayer that want it to impact their hearts and their lives and the way we perceive the other, the way we treat the other. So we thank you for this time together. We thank you for examples like the nurse at the orphanage who tragically didn't survive. She was your hands, she was your feet, she was your arms, and she gave everything. Might we not be discouraged by that, but might we be inspired to clearly see there are things worth living for and things worth dying for. And we trust you, Lord, to help us see those things. And we pray this with confidence because of Jesus. Amen.